Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Your Bible's open to Ezekiel. Uh, last two sermons we looked at Jesus again his life. That he calmed the storm, and then as soon as the storm was over with, they landed on the shore, and he was approached by the demoniacs, and he cast out the demons. And so, hopefully, it gave you the opportunity to think about demons, and why are there demons, and why is there a devil, and why is there evil when there's a perfect, just, and righteous God? How did evil come to be? If you are not familiar with your Bible, and you don't know the origin of evil from the scriptural story, the world has plenty, plenty of tales of how evil came to be. In Eastern thought and religion, evil and good have to cohabitate with each other. And you have to have one and the other to have balance. But is that how God created in the beginning? Turn to Genesis chapter 1. And let's lay a foundation for today's uh, message. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Does anybody know what it says before you get there? What does it say? Ricky, what does it say? It's uh, for baseball, it's first mentioned in the Bible, in the big inning. In the big inning, I like that. That's how I remember. In the beginning, God what? Created. Okay, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So right there, from the very beginning of the Word of God, you find out who is the one that made everything, right? Is there anyone above God? No. no. Outside of the three people in the Godhead, is there anyone equal with God? No. God stands alone, right? Now, have you ever thought about this? If you remember the story, God gave promises to Abraham. And at one point... God came to Abraham, and God swore a promise to him. Who's God going to swear by? Himself. That's the only one he had to swear by. Now, that's when, when God swore to Abraham, it was an oath. Today, in our culture, we would sign a contract. We would sign a legal document, right? They didn't do that back then, so they would swear. They would swear by an authority higher or a power bigger than them. So God comes to Abraham, and he swears to him a promise that through you and through your seed, I will bless all nations, and I will multiply you as well. Yeah. And he swears to him, but who's he going to swear by? Himself. himself, because there's no one above him, and there's no one equal to him. Always understand that, because God is God, and there's no other. And so when it says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, then you realize that everything that you see was made by Him. So where did evil come from? And this has been something that has perplexed humanity since the fall of Adam and Eve. Turn to the Gospel of John. And let's look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Does anybody know what that says? It says, in the beginning, just like it says in Genesis, in the beginning. Genesis says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the Gospel of John, it says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. And that all things that were created were created by Him. Right? So again, you find out that God is the Creator. This is why we worship Him, because He created us. And He deserves that worship, because He created us. Does that make sense to you guys? Are we, as human beings, the only thing God created? What else did He create as higher beings? Angels, right? So what you find out is before God created this earth, Angels were already created. And that at some point, something happened in heaven. Now, when God created angels, did He create them perfect? 
Yeah. Or did he create you with some flaws? Yeah. When your mom and dad made you, were you born with flaws or were you born perfect? Okay, so we are flawed, but yet when God created angels, he created them perfect. For whatever purpose God had, that's what they were created for, and they were perfect in that creation. So, Genesis, the Gospel of John, shows that God is the creator. Now, what kind of God is this? Turn to Psalm 89, the book of Psalm, chapter 89. And let's look at verse 14. Psalms 89, 14. What's that first word? Justice. Justice or righteousness. So, what kind of God do we serve? A God of justice and a God of righteousness. This is a very important uh, point and foundation. So from the New King James, verse 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the what? The foundation of your throne. So what's the foundation of God's throne? Justice, justice and righteousness. Is there any shadow of darkness in that? Is there any darkness in God? No. Does God operate off that yin-yang no. uh, theory no. and ideal? God is light. God is pure. There is no darkness in Him. And when God creates, there was no darkness in His creation. Amen. Doesn't need to have both to be balanced out. So, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth do what? Go before your face. So this God that we serve, this God that created everything, is just, he's merciful, and he is righteous. And everything that he created would be the same way. So let's look at some other texts. Let's go to Psalm chapter 96, and let's look at verse 6. Psalm 96, verse 6. And it says, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are what? In his sanctuary. We are celebrating this week what? And why do we celebrate Memorial Day? To honor those that have fallen in service. Is it an honorable thing to serve for your country? Absolutely. Yes. So we, in our fallen state, still have an idea of what honor really is, right? Those of you who have taken the marriage vow, does it speak about honoring your spouse? Absolutely. Right? So God, in His character, has a character of honor. When He says something, it is truth. He does not lie. He does not steal. He does not bear false witness or say bad things about people, right? God is honorable, and this is why we can trust Him. So listen, I bring you these texts, and I've got one more in Hebrews, because I want you to think of, if God is this way and He's perfect, how did sin come into existence? If God created everything and it was perfect, what happened? What you say, right? This. It is a mystery. Do you know why it's a mystery? And do you know why it's so hard to explain? Because if you could explain it, then you could justify it. And there is no justification for evil, hence there's no explanation for it. Why it still perplexes us after all of these millennia. So turn to Hebrews chapter 1. This will be a New Testament. Towards the back. Hebrews chapter 1. And let's look at verse 8. Hebrews 1 verse 8 says, But to the Son he says, Your throne, O God, is for how long? Forever, Forever and ever. 
A scepter of, here's that word again, a scepter of what? Is the scepter of your kingdom. What is a scepter? You know, because you gave me one last week to wear when I played Jesus. What is a scepter? Say it loud, because you're right. It's like a rod. Uh, it's what a king or somebody in authority would hold in his hand. And it showed his authority. Okay? So, the scepter of the throne of God is righteousness. You need to understand this because there are a lot of questions about who God is and what He's really like. And a lot of people who claim to be Christians do not know the true character of God. And if we're the ones that are supposed to show the world who don't believe what God is really like, and we don't know what He's like, how's that going to work? Amen. It's going to work the way it has worked, and that is not very well. Okay? The world wants to see that there is a God, that He's compassionate, that He loves, and that this evil is not the most powerful force in the universe. But unfortunately, that's what the world sees, and that is what the world has embraced. The world has embraced evil, and has called good evil, and has called evil good. And that is because... God's people have not done a good job at representing who and what He really is. That's what the word obedience comes in. Very good. That's right. Now, as you look at Hebrews, and it says that, again, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, Your throne of God is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and did what? Hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. I took Jehovah Witnesses to this verse. And again, they used the New World's translation. But I asked them, I said, why, if, if, if there's just one, and that's Jehovah, only one, why does he keep speaking to another? And they looked at me the same way you are. What does it say here when it's talking about God? Your throne, though God, is forever and ever. You understand that. Who is he talking about in the Godhead? Whose Father, throne is forever and ever? Is it the Father, is it the Son, or is it the Spirit? The Father is talking to the Son. The Father is talking to the Son. How do you know that? We'll go to the uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 1. It said that in times past, God spoke to the people through prophets. But now he speaks to them through his son and never changes off of that. And he goes into this verse here and he goes, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. That's Jesus. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lovelessness. Therefore, God, you're God. How do you explain that? There's no way there. Can you get out of that? Let's rewrite scripture. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Anyway, so again, I want you to see what God's government, what God's character, and what God's throne is based on. And it's based on righteousness. What does that word righteousness mean? Byron said, again, he brought out very good. It's one of the uh, definitions of righteousness for us to God is obedience. Is that right? That if we want to be righteous and we want to show God we love Him, then do we not obey Him? Okay? But righteousness is right doing. Is that right? Righteousness is also a character trait. That's who your God is, right? Righteousness is right doing. I agree with that. But righteousness is never wrong. Yes. It, that's why it's righteous. It's always right. There is no deviation. There's no darkness. There is no going the other way. Amen. What's the opposite of right? Wrong. Wrong. Right? So God's character is not based on wrongness. I say that one three times real fast. <laughs> okay? It's based on righteousness because that's all God is. He's righteous. There is no evil in him. You need to understand that because the world says God is the cause of all the problems. 
God is the cause of all of the suffering. And that's not true. God is righteous, and His character is righteous, and His government is righteous. And when He created, He created in righteousness. Everything was good, and everything was pure, and everything was holy. But something happened. So, the foundation of God's government is love. And is a law just like gravity. That if I got up on this roof and I jumped off, am I going to go up or am I going to go down? Go down. Right, that's a law, right? So, God's law is love. And whatever God created was created under that law. So, when God created angels, they were created to love. And they were created to love others and be other-centered and not self-centered. Do you know what happened to all of Adam's children when they fell? What was the thing that affected them on a DNA level? They became selfish. Every single human being after the fall would be born with a self-centered nature. And all you have to do is look at a baby find out how true that is. And that little baby will grow up into an adult that's just as selfish, probably even more selfish. Okay? This is why Jesus has to come and give us a new heart and create a new character for us. One that is like what God originally intended. A character that is selfless, not selfish. So God creates the angels and He creates them as servants. What's the word angel mean? Messenger or servant, okay? That's what their whole existence was about. It was to serve, to be God's servants and messengers. They were not worried about themselves. They were not worried about climbing God's corporate ladder. They weren't worried about getting to the next peg higher and higher and higher. They were there to love and to show love and to be messengers for God. But something changed in the order of the angelic host. And we'll look at that this morning. God's government is based on the foundation of love and also the foundation of free will. Did angels have free will? Absolutely. Are you born with free will? Yes. And do you want to die with free will? Yes. Yes, because that is a key characteristic of who God is. Amen. God is true freedom. Amen. So listen. So he creates this one angel and his name was Lucifer. The sun of the morning. The bright and morning star. Lucifer, the light bearer. What was Lucifer's job? Covering cherub. He was the. He was the covering cherub, but he was the light bearer. That in the angelic order, Lucifer was the smartest, the brightest, and the highest of all the angels. And the other angels had no problem with that order. And they had no problem taking direction from Lucifer. So where did the problem come from? The problem came from Lucifer himself because Lucifer was not happy with his order. Lucifer looked at himself and looked at Christ and said, I'm just as powerful and just as wise and just as beautiful as he is. Why am I not allowed into the very counsels of God? And that created this one thing and that was jealousy, which led to, well, actually, what happened first was he looked at himself and started to become prideful. That lifted him up. And in that pride, he looked at Christ, and then envy and jealousy arose in his heart because he wanted to be like Jesus. So let's look at, and I'll give you the scriptural text for this, let's look at Ezekiel 28 again. Ezekiel 28, let's look at verses 12 through 15. That's going back into the Old Testament. Ezekiel 
Ezekiel 28, verse 12 Son of man, take up a lamentation with the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord. Now again, it talks about the king of Tyre, but you're going to find out here very quickly that this is actually speaking of the origins of uh, Satan, who used to be Lucifer. Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of what? Perfection. Full of wisdom and perfect in what? <laughs> perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. The garden of God and every precious stone was your covering. The workmanship, I'm skipping down, the workmanship of your trembles and your pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. So was Lucifer created? Yes. 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 Who created him? And the answer is God. And it was Jesus, the active agent of creation. We found that out in the first part of John. Okay? And that when he was called forth, he was called forth in perfection and in beauty and in wisdom. And there was no other created being as intelligent, as wise, and as gifted as Lucifer. What do you think, what do you think that means, right? It means he did. He did. Saying like nobody ever has ever. This is why you always hear Adventists say that Lucifer led the angelic choir. Because of this set of verses right here. Okay? Because when God made him, it says his trembles and his pipes that mean meant to his voice. Now, why do you think music today is such a divisive issue? And why do you think Satan controls a lot of the music that you hear? And why do you think it's so important that you be careful with what you listen to? And that it's even more important that you be careful with what you bring inside the church to worship to? Amen. Thank you. So listen. God creates them. You find out that He's created perfect. But something happened. Verse 14 says that you were the anointed cherub who covers. He says, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Verse 15. What does it say? You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. And here you go. Until what happened? <laughs> Until iniquity was found in you. What does that word iniquity mean? Sin. Sin. So did God create him with iniquity? No. Did God create him imperfect? No. What does it say? Twice it says he was created perfect in all his ways. But as Ray said, it was a mystery. Something happened and iniquity, sin was found in him. What? is sin. John gives you the definition of what sin is. Sin is what? Transgression of the law. Or lawlessness, right? So, if you want to know was there a law in heaven and were angels bound under this law, what is sin? Lawlessness. Lawlessness. So, if iniquity was found in him, what did he do? He transgressed the law of God. Hence, there was a law that he transgressed. Gary? Satan was the first apostate. Yes. He was the first one to have sin found in him, to go against God's law. So, let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 14. Not Ezekiel, I'm sorry, Isaiah. Isaiah 14, it's going to be backwards. Three books back. Isaiah 14... Let's look at verses 12 through 14. And you're going to find out just what changed in Lucifer. Isaiah 14. Now remember, when God created him, he was created selfless. He was not selfish. That his whole entire being was made to serve. To serve the other angels and to serve and worship God. Okay? He never thought about himself. He was never thinking about, well, if I do this, this will make me look good. Or if I get rid of this guy, I can take his position. You know what I'm saying? It was all about doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's why this is such a mystery because 
the law was written in his heart. And that's what we're seeking to have done. Amen. He had that. He had that. So Ezekiel, I mean Isaiah 14, verse 12, it says, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, now I want you to look how many times the word I is used. Who uses the word I? Selfish beings or selfless beings? Okay. You're going to see this change that took place. And you're going to see how Lucifer viewed his world. It was no longer viewed as, what can I do for you? It is, what can you do for me? And what can I become? Okay. Verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 12, and then 13. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, I want you to think about this. Would you ever have the nerve to say, I will be like the Most High? Now, see, it's easy for us to say that because, believe me, many men and many women have said that in their hearts. Yeah. Not even knowing that that's what they meant. But when you look for worldly ambition and worldly gain and you want to place yourself on the top, that is exactly what you're saying. I will be like the Most High. I will control my destiny. Bye. I will take care of everything. God. Does God take care of everything? Yes. Is God in control? Yes. yes. Is there anybody above Him? No. Is there anybody beside Him? No. Okay. When we exalt ourselves in this life, little men raising our fists to God, we say the same thing. I will be like God. Ricky? Transgression is separation from God. We unplug from God. Mm. And, and when we do, God lets us go. Yes. And that's exactly what he let Satan do. And that's why he's then that's why we have what we have today. So Satan says, I will ascend to the very heights of the throne of the Most High. In verse 15, what does God say? Yet you shall be brought down to hell itself to the lowest depths of the pit. Because there is no one, no one that is equal or above God. Now, I've asked this question before because this is a question that I always think about every time I read this thing. There is something about God that Lucifer knew that we do not know. Because is Lucifer smarter than we are? Yeah. yeah. Now, when I read this, I would say that guy is just the stupidest moron that you would ever meet. How would you ever expect to say, I will be above God? But there was something about God that he understood that we don't. Do you know what that was? He loved him no matter what. It was the very character of God. Say it loud because you're right. He loved him no matter what. Yeah. Lucifer took God's patience and God's endurance of trying to win him back. And he took that as a liberty to continue on in his rebellion. Yeah. You, you, you've proved the point in verse 15. As a human being, God saying to you, listen to this, you, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the side of the pit. Now God is saying this to Lucifer. Now let's just think about that. The, 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 the fact that God said this. And Ooh. God is never wrong. And God is always right. Now there's two ways to read this. God in His love and in His mercy. Again, I told you that if you guys get a chance, take Patriarchs and Prophets and read chapter 1. Because yeah. that's what this is about, the origin of evil. And that's where I got this sermon from. When you read this, Lucifer had already fallen, and he already turned into Satan, and God tells him, this will be your end. But there's two ways to read that, and that is, in a judgmental way, this is what's happening to you, buddy. You're going to go to hell, and you're going to be brought to the lowest pit. But before he fell, when there was time to still have him change his mind, don't you think God said the same thing to him? But he said it this way, 
listen, if you continue in this course, this is going to be the outcome. Don't let this happen. But if you stray from the truth, and if you sin, I'll have no other choice but bring you down to the depths of hell itself. Amen. To the lowest part of the pit. Don't go there. That's not what I want from you. I love you. I want you to come back. Amen. Yeah, Gary? Just like, oh, Gary? just like we're talking about in Sabbath school, it's a gradual thing before you finally get to the apostate position. 